good to be in God's house and with God's people worshiping and praising him and declaring who he is and drawing strength from that and uh, just keep in prayer uh, Donna and Sonny right now they're on the way to the emergency room and we are really uh, just lifting them up in prayer today so and if you have prayer requests just God knows what they are just lift them to him as we worship God inhabits the praises of his people so let's Allow him to minister to us by just surrendering and worship to him. Praise his name. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me song my lord you sung it sung by flaming times above there my heart is fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming love here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue. Me from danger interpose his precious blood. Oh, to grace, oh, to grace, how great a debt daily I'm constrained to be. Let your grace, Lord, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. Yes, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. Sing it again. Here's my heart. 
for your presence, Lord. We long for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. The Holy Spirit is here, and as he's a wonderful, wonderful part of the Trinity of God. Holy Spirit, for being in this place with us. Help us not to quench you. There's nothing worth more that can ever come close. Nothing can compare your unending heart. Your prayer and seen. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. I welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you 
Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, through the blood of Jesus that you paid such a, a costly price for us to be able to walk into the very holy, holy, holy presence of God. Thank you that you don't dwell in buildings made with hands, but you dwell in hearts made of flesh. says that the, if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will lift us up.
exalt his name. He is worthy. He sits high on the throne. And he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And we have been appointed. Those are the heirs of his salvation. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. It's hard to stop it. <laughs> but you can be seated. You can be seated if you can. Uh, brother Ken, come on, brother. Amen. Good morning, Grace Community Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. As Brother Roosevelt said, it is hard to stop giving God the glory and the praise this morning, isn't it? Especially when it's so good to us and he's been so awesome to us. Can anybody testify to that this morning? Amen. God is an awesome God. Well, again, welcome to Grace Community Church. We're so glad that you have come to be with us this morning. You could have chosen to go anywhere this morning, but we're so glad that you came to be with us this morning. And to our guests online, we're so glad that you have chosen to join in with us this morning for an awesome time of praise and worship and a word from our Brother Vincent, who was going to deliver to us this morning, he did an awesome job last Sunday, and I'm sure he will this Sunday. You know, our pastor, Dr. Ben Wilkins, is on vacation, and uh, we just like to say, uh, I'm, I'm sure he's watching. Welcome this morning, Pastor Ben, online this morning. And Brother ben, Vincent, would you come on up and uh, share with us what God has given and what he has put on your heart to share with us this morning? Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Let the church say amen. 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 God good to us. Amen. To Pastor Ben and his absence. Uh, hope you're having a whole lot of fun, brother. I want to go on vacation, too. <laughs> Amen. Uh, last week, we talked about being grounded at the bush, and that message was about Moses having um, a meeting with God at the burning bush. But the message not about the meeting with God at the bush. It's about prayer. How important prayer is. And the burning bush for Moses was like a staple in his life. It was like a hinge in his life. It was a turning point in his life. So that's where we're going to pick up on at part two today. But if you allow me to devote this message and get myself together, I want you to join with me in prayer yeah. <clears throat> before we get started. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for gathering us together in the spirit of love, fellowship, family, and unity. Lord, we ask now that we, you, you, you bless this message. Remove Vincent out of the way. And let those who are under the sound of my voice hear your voice, the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask that this message rest and abide in somebody's heart and help them for the rest of their lives. We know that you can't have a spiritual life without prayer. And Father, this is what we are aiming to do. In the name of Jesus, this is our prayer, and we all said amen. 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 There is an old song that I grew up on, and it starts like this. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Do y'all know that? Can we sing that? Yes. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, y'all sound good. <laughs> All our sins and griefs to bear. 
What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not put your hearts in that, y'all. And read everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and t- temptations? Is there trouble? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord. And last verse. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord. Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? We learned last week. We learned last week that Moses, from the beginning of his life, for 60 years up until the burning bush, we learned that Moses didn't have a prayer life. Well, the Bible didn't speak much on Moses having a prayer life. How many of us have lived so many years in our lives and didn't develop a prayer life. We learned that Moses had some trouble in his life. I submit to you that it's because of a weak prayer life. But I want to dip back just a little bit back in Exodus, the history book of Exodus, to where his mother paid special attention to how she protected Moses for a reason. God needed Moses to be around for a purpose. He said that he had heard the cries of his people because of their oppression and that he needed somebody, a tool to use to emancipate his people. Listen to what Exodus 2, verse 3 says, just a little, short, insignificant scripture that's packed with golden nuggets. When she could not hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. That sounds sounds insignificant and and innocent enough, don't it? But listen to what, listen to what, what I heard. Listen to what God gave me to give to you. See, that was an order from the federal government to throw away all of the boy babies that were born. But God has put a special kind of love in the heart of a mother. It's not easy for a mother to throw her baby away. You can't tell the mother to harm her child, but now you want her to Throw, take her newborn child, throw it in the river, 
and act like this didn't happen. That's just not going to happen. So what we got here is a mother who saw that her child was handsome and she decided to keep her baby in the middle of a I started to say a pandemic, but, but, in the, but in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of an edict, a law that was passed, she decided to break the law in her own home. Look at what, look at, look at what she did. She kept her child under extreme danger. Number two, this mother fed her child in secret to keep other folk out of her business. Number three, this mother started preparing for him to give her child the best odds of survival under the worst conditions. Mm-hmm. Can, I, can I unpack that for you? Under the extreme conditions, it was against the law to have a baby that age. Officers were walking around looking for this child, for any child. You have people in your household who would run the risk of snitching on you. So she had to find a way to keep a crying baby nursed and fed and healthy. So when she couldn't do it any longer, the Bible says she got a papyrus basket. Papyrus is a long stalk like plant with a skin coating on it that grows in a marshes area along uh, uh, the Nile. Yeah. So what she did during those three months, she had started to plan. She developed a plan and she worked a plan. While she's nursing, she got a baby strapped on her somewhere. She's chopping marsh. She's taking long strips of marsh and she's stripping it. She's taking the strippings and she's tying the papyrus together and she's making a basket and then she's taking some more marsh and she's boiling it, boiling the oil out of it till it makes a tar. The tar is a liquid waterproof substance that she pours on the basket. But tar and pitch is when it dries, it gets hard. So she made a basket that's waterproof that she can stick somewhere that if it bump against something, it won't be easily punctured. Oh God, I want you to know that God has prepared a way for you. That when he has a purpose for you in your life, that he prepares a way. He got a plan for you. He, he, he'll go and he'll do some chopping for you. He has a way of saving you for your purpose so that you can make it under the worst conditions. Look at what she did. She picked a, a, a material that's fit for the job, for her purpose. She constructed and assembled a basket. Now, he, 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 here's what got me. She placed a child inside the basket. Now, the law says, take your baby and throw it in water. (laughs) Take your baby and and put him in a situation where the odds of survival are slim to none. How how many of us know that that, that, that people will go and jump into situations without any planning and they they, they have no chance of survival? But I, I, I submit to you that when you do that, you do that under the absence of a prayer life. When you got prayer life, prayer teaches you to sit down and plan. When you got prayer life, prayer teaches you to go and pick the right materials for what you're trying to do. When you got a prayer life, God will lead you around the right people to guide and, and, and counsel you to get your job done. Am I in the house in here? She, 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 she placed the baby in the basket. The basket is able to stand the water. The basket is able to withstand puncture. 
But 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 also the basket, she placed it among the reeds. She 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 chopped reeds to make the basket. You see that? Did that go over y'all here? She she chopped reeds to make the basket. She constructed the basket and she cooked. But now listen, she could have taken it been, been like some of us, taken that basket and and and, and spray painted it neon green and put bright orange colors and stripes on it. You know, she could have made it nice and pretty and tucked it out there in the open so everybody can see it. But her purpose was to give her son the best chance of survival. So she used the same material that she that she tucked it in the same material that she used to disguise. I wish somebody I wish somebody knew what I was trying to say. She used the same material and tucked it in the same place that she got them from to disguise what she was trying to do. Because, see, your enemy is trying to stop you from getting to where you're going. Don't you know God would hide you when you got something planned? The Bible says in Psalms 21, 5, for in the day of trouble, he will conceal me. In his tabernacle, in the secret place of his tent, he will hide. Somebody say, hide me. Somebody say, hide me, Lord. He will lift me up on a rock. In preparation for our purpose, he will find, we will find that God has protected us. We'll find uh, uh, along the way that he's provided for us and he has prepared a way for us. God did this for Moses as an infant. He did it for him as an adolescent. He did it for him as a young man. He did it for him as an old man. God has done things for us in our lives. He's kept us safe under extreme conditions. Y'all know I had a gun pointed at me one time from a friend. A friend, uh, 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 my girlfriend at the time, I was in high school, and there was a gun in my house, and we end up at my house for lunch, for school, and we were playing around with this pistol, 38 snub nose revolver, and I, I showed it to her, you know how kids do playing with guns, and set it on the table, and her name was Lynn at the time, and she went over there, and she picked the gun up. And she said, Vince, and she had this gun pointed dead at me. And I'm standing there, now 38 snub no, the, the barrel on this oh, is about as wide as my thumb. But when you standing there looking at a loaded gun, the barrel looked like it's about that big. Wow. Scared to death, and I felt the spirit come over, and I said, Lynn, the gun is loaded. She put the gun down on the table and screamed like nothing ever. Happened. I mean, just scream. But I saw death because she and and she told me that she was about to pull the trigger. Don't you know God will protect you? Thank you, Lord. Somebody ought to thank God for saving my life that day. I know. I said, thank you, God. God has provided us for us when we ourselves didn't have a clue where our next blessing was going to come from. Mm, that one did something to me right there because that ain't the first time. That ain't the only time. And God has a plan for our lives to survive under extreme circumstances. Let me, let, let me, let me. Submit this to you. Consider your plans for your child going off to college, to military, or in the workforce. They'll be amongst every kind of demonic spirit when they get to school. They'll be around all kinds of twisted philosophies, all kinds of perverse thought patterns, misguided religions, these kids are out there partying, 
drinking, doing all kinds of things, compulsive liars, thieves are all around them. Don't you know they need protecting? And you want them to remain steadfast to Christianity. Let me ask you a question. What did you do to prepare your child to be in the best place possible for success when he get to college? What did you give your child when he gets to the military and he run across this Muslim, this nation of Islam, who's on top of his game? What did you give your child? How did you prepare him to enter the workforce? Oh, God, I'm in here now. Boy, y'all quiet. See how you're looking at me? But let me tell you how you could have done it. First thing you should have done is teach him how to pray. Because scripture says when you teach him how to pray, you teach him how to put his clothes on. You teach him how to put on his whole, his whole armor from his head down to his feet. You see, God will give him weapons and give him a shield and give him a sword and he cover his heart. But if you don't teach him how to pray, you set him up for failure. Am I in the house? Am I doing all right? So from the basket to the bush is approximately 60 years. And God has covered Moses all of his life. We see Moses' childhood influences, I like to call them common ground. He lived 60 years of life doing nothing out of the ordinary but getting in trouble, (laughs) running from the law, looking over his shoulders. We see him in his education. We we see him in his heritage. We see him with his dual culture. We see him in his personal growth. We see Moses grow up. We knew that he grew up, but we don't see him growing up. We see his stature as a man, as a baby, and then a man. We see his anger. We see his fears. We see his mischief. We see his love. All of this is commonality. It's common ground. We see that this man has taken on a wife. We see that. We see this man get a job. We see he's surrounded by people that's not like him. Not his color. We see him as a foreigner. He's an educated man with an Israelite heritage, an Egyptian trained culture amongst people he don't know. Looks familiar around here. Black man standing here in a multicultural church from where I come from wasn't nothing but black folk. So I'm in here. But God has protected me along the way. I could have had my brains blown out. But here I am today teaching some God filled people that prayer is one of the most is the most important thing in your life when it comes to your faith yeah Yeah, that's a good time to praise God right there but up until the burning bush we don't see Moses with a prayer life I'm convinced that the absence of a strong prayer life can very well be the evidence of struggle in your life because we do things without going to God first. Scripture tells us that we should acknowledge God 
in all things. And he will direct. Come on, preacher. Direct our path. Now that we have a have a prayer life. God has some work to do. Now that God got your attention, he's got some work to do. Now he's got your attention. He's got to do some uncovering. Because, see, for 60 years, he's been complacent where he was. For 60 years, he was running from the law. For 60 years, he was dipping into somebody else's business. For 60 years, he's on the backside of a mountain doing nothing. Well, let me take that back. Because shepherding God's sheep is training. And God used that training later on in life. There are some things in us, in our minds, and in our hearts that must be reformatted. There are some things in, 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 in our lives, in our minds, that has to be unlearned. We got some bad habits that we got to get rid of. God got some work cut out for him because some of us, baby, let me tell you, some of our attitudes are just bad. Some of our mindsets are just rotten. But we say God is our Lord and he wants to use us for a purpose. God has some work to do. He got some work to do on me, man. I don't know about you. You look like you pretty good guy. He ain't got that much work to do. But me, <laughs> let me tell you something. He needs his power tools on me, brother. <laughs> I've, I've come a long way. Yeah. But I'm not out of the woods yet. Yeah. Just like Moses at the bush, God is restoring his child. From the inside out to fulfill his purpose in setting a whole nation free. You know what? I like to call this part buried treasures. Allow me to run through this as quick as I can. I want to unpack some things. And I want to talk to the folks that's been, that's been taught to believe in themselves, yet and still they don't have They don't know the power that they possess deep inside of their own spirits. Their God-given gifts and promises are buried. They're buried. God said there is treasure on the inside of you in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 9. He says uh, 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 that, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are afflicted in every way, but not constrained. The world wants us to know that we, wants us to believe that we are perplexed, but our spirit says we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. The power of God is on the inside of us. There are excellent treasures of God buried in you. Last week, I kind of dedicated the message to the men of the house. Where the men at? Here we are. Here, Mills. I want this message to sort of rest on you. I want this message to hit a little different with you. God is saying to us, the men, we may be bent, but we're not broken. We may be buried, but we're not lost. We would do well to pray more, but the spirit of man is covered. Buried under layers and layers of secular issues. Buried under financial concerns and worldly thought patterns. So much so that it seems like it is a useless 
treasure hunt to find the real promise in, in us. Speaking from experience and countless conversations that I've had with other men, we see ourselves in a certain light, and it's confusing and frustrating to us when other people see us in a different light, and the light's not so pretty. See if, I, see, if I tell you I'm a good man, but you see me fighting and cussing, shooting dice, doing things I shouldn't do, what you see is a rotten man. But I'm believing because I love my children and my mother and I get up and I go to work, I believe I'm a pretty good guy. But your actions not lining up with what you feel. You see, Moses, like Moses, we've been doing things our way under our own power. We see ourselves through the confidence of our own physical abilities, not our spiritual abilities. And that confidence has developed a secular mindset for us. I I want you to listen to this. We believe we can do all things within our own power, and that belief system is in our head. You can't tell us what we can't do. Not as long as my muscles are strong and I'm able to do it. I can lift it. I can take it. But that's not a spiritual fight. The Bible says we wrestle not against, is in the word, flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and spirits and high places. Muscles won't do you any good when it's time to fight a principle. Is that good? We act like we don't need Listen to this grammar. We don't need no God to do something I can do for myself. That's my, that's my education right there. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm intelligent. We don't need no God to do what I can do for myself. That's the mentality that we are born with. We see ourselves as strong, smart, capable, caring, competent, Tough, faithful, and prepared. The problem is our actions don't line up with our personal belief. We know in our hearts we are good people, but because of some of our actions, our language, our inconsistencies, others don't see the same good. Let me ask you something. Have you ever heard a teacher say, your child is smart. But he just don't apply himself. (laughs) Anybody ever heard that? I can't tell you how many times my mama heard that about me. (laughs) Your child is smart. He just won't apply himself. That's when that's when I brought home that C or that D home. But I'm able to recite every lyric of my favorite song on the radio. (laughs) <laughs> I'm moving on. See, that's a buried, that's a buried treasure. Yeah. Consider the person who can, can be a master architect. He's smart enough to be, Mike, he's smart enough to be a master architect. He can vision things beyond his wildest imagination. But he just won't apply himself. Or that man who's capable of being a doctor of philosophy. He can contribute to any line of educational discipline and present the most compelling dissertation that any scholar has ever heard. But his mind is buried under a self-taught, street-learned, hustle-minded, grind-hearted landfill of misguided information. Or that man who's capable of being a loving father. 
of daughters and sons, nurturing and caring, providing a, a firm hand and wise counsel, approachable and fun. But his heart is smothered with the cares of self-inflicted ignorance caused by a lack of spiritual growth. He's a husband, loyal and kind, a protector, a priest of his home, but his spirit is immature and malnourished, and his prayer life is limited to saying a practice rehearsed childhood script over his family's life. All right. Come on, preacher. Can you see the buried treasure? He's willing to be vulnerable. He's not willing to be vulnerable to God. He's underneath self-pride, fear, ignorance, and embarrassment. He's ashamed to admit his insufficiencies to God. Do you see the kinds of things that when you come to God in prayer, after living such a long life, can you see the work that's cut out for him? Can you see what has to be removed off of top of your, your precious gifts, your treasure? Things have to be removed from your mind. Hatred has to be removed from your heart. Stupidity has to be replaced with wisdom. God has his work cut out for him. I can't speak for you, but God has done a great work in me. And he mentions in his scripture that what he started, he says, he promises, he'll finish. God is not a half-hearted, undone type of God. Listen, the biggest benefit of being in the presence of God is holiness rules. Holiness exposes truth of all things. God wants to uncover us He wants to dust us off. He wants to clean us up. He wants to shine us up. He wants to polish us. Not to my likeness, but to his likeness. When you look in the mirror and you think about the things going on in your life, Do you feel like you're in the image of God? Do you see the holiness of God when you look in the mirror? You see, when you meet your burning bush, God has commenced to changing you. Because the first thing he did was tell you to take your shoes off. Because now the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. There is no condemnation on holy ground. There are no sins on holy ground. So all your sins got to be purged, got to be removed. And he just can't go in and snatch your sins off of you. You got to be processed. Once you go to God in prayer, it is in your best interest that you stay with God in prayer. We see how God used Moses to do a great work, the the, the face of an emancipated people, the giver of a law, but Moses didn't start there. He started as a fugitive of the law, a murderer. And now he's a leader of a nation, 
of God's people. But when you read the story, you find out that Moses never left the presence of the Lord. During his training, he stayed there. But everywhere he went, he took his training with him. When you leave church, do you take church with you? When you leave Bible study, do you take the scriptures with you? When you study, do you meditate? Do you share what God has given to you with others? Do you lead anybody in prayer with your friends at their own home? What evidence do you have that say God's been working on you? There are so many people who carry shortcomings in their hearts. It's unbelievable. You know why? It's shameful about some of the things that that, that they, they, they just cannot share with some of the things that's going on in their lives, some of the things that has happened to them in their past. Men and women are hiding experiences that happened to them so long ago. They, 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 they're hiding it, and they're burying these things. They're covering up these things as if they never happened. You can think back on some of these things. You know, y- y'all know some of the stories. Don't you? They participated in some things that shattered their own belief system. They suppressed something so terrible for so long within themselves, hoping to forget it forever as if it never happened in order to protect themselves from losing their own mind. He says he has no way of knowing, that person has no way of knowing that those experiences that's been buried has charted an unhealthy path of mental disability, misguided perceptions, bad decision making, a lack of temperament. Your buried treasure is some sort of secular coping mechanism. Church, I'm telling you, I believe God is working on us through prayer. Listen, T.D. Jake says this. He says, deep prayer cannot be done in public. But the concerns, there are some concerns that are so private of an issue, it should not be overheard by casual ears. Often, they are too private for even our wives and children to hear. Ain't that something? That's buried deep in there. So the person without prayer is a living, treasured, buried alive. Living, breathing, functioning, present and accounted for souls are secretly buried under fears of failure, buried under depression due to pressure, buried under overworked and underpaid, buried under distracted by his surroundings. He's grasping for air. Can you see him? Am I painting a picture for you? He's pushing and struggling to breathe. He's clawing and pulling back dirt, dirty thoughts and worldly ways. He's trying to breathe. That treasure is in there trying to get out, but cannot find his way out alone. I'm in here. But God can reach him. And extract him from a mindless tomb of doubt, fear, and insecurities. But somebody has to teach him (laughs) 
to pray. Not so much on teaching how to pray, but somebody has to teach him to go to God in prayer. Listen, we don't, a lot of people don't pray, and I'm, I'm just about out of here. People are bashful when it's time to pray because we think it's more important to get our words right, speak well, sound good so we don't sound like we're new to this thing. <laughs> but it's more important to get your spirit right in front of God than it is to impress man with your fancy words. Jesus has some things to say about that. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrite. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, yes. see, prayer, touch yourself on chat yes. and, and, and say this. Prayer is for me. Oh, y'all, y'all, you see, y'all, y'all act like. Y'all act like y'all don't, don't have a prayer life. Say, say that. Prayer is for me. Prayer is for me. When I pray, I'm talking to God. Yeah. But listen, when I pray, God is talking to me. Yeah. See, when I pray, I'm, I'm developing a relationship. Guess, guess what you're doing in a relationship? You're learning one another. But God already knows everything about God already knows everything about you. I read in the scriptures that he knows the number of hairs you have on your head or used to. <laughs> he says that you're wonderfully and fearfully made. God has an intricate interest in your life. He spent time on constructing how you would be. God knows everything there is to know about you. He knows how hard-headed you are. He knows how hot-headed you can be. He knows how bull-headed you have been. But guess what? When you got a relationship with God, he don't have to learn you. He knows. But when you got a relationship with God, you learn him. Amen. You will never know everything there is to know about God. So for the rest of your life, you're learning something new about the most important power in the world. And he lives on the inside of you. You see, when we handle things ourselves, we play like we God. Our little control issues. It's time for us to give it up. Give up our little Godship. <laughs> Hand it over to Jesus. Jesus says, if you give me your yoke, I give you mine. And he promises that his yoke is easier. Is that what he said? Listen, we're worn out. We're tired. We're frustrated, overwhelmed, scared out of our minds about what's next in our lives. Our society, our country is in a mess. Political controversy is all over the place. Racial division has got us paralyzed. Our education system are, is failing our children. Our religious organizations seems like we have no power. We, we can't go to war as church members, as Christians. You know why? Because we'll lose if we go to war as a, as a church right now. Can I, can I unpack this and tell you why? Because, you see, the gays are out marching during the Pride, pride Month. Is that right? Yeah. They're making noise about what they believe. 
Republicans are making noise about what they believe. Democrats are making noise about what they believe. Abortionists are making noise about what they believe. But guess what? Republican church, church folks ain't making no noise. But let me tell you something. Republicans claim to be Christians. Democrat claims to be Christians. Abortionists claim to be Christians. Everybody else that got problems claim to be Christians. The Bible says that a house divided cannot stand. We got a problem with getting together as one body in Christ. We can't fight together when we're fighting one another. The world will win if God's folk don't get it together. It has to start here in prayer. Oh, I got to wrap this up. So this is my charge. Women, ask your man to pray with you. Ask him to pray for you in private, intimately, quietly. Where my man at? Leading him in a sacred place of prayer. Mothers, let your sons and your daughters lead you in prayer. In family prayer, at the dinner table, and and, and when you're having serious conversations, men release the pride of vulnerability to God. Learn to pray in confidence, in spirit, and in truthfulness. Lead your son, fathers, men, lead your sons and your daughters, your wives, your mothers, in prayer because God is waiting on you to be the priest of your home. Did you hear what I said? God is waiting on you, the man, the leader of your home, to be the priest of your home. If you are not leading your family in prayer, you are out of order. God did not make the woman the head of the household. He made the man the head of the household, which means that he has a spiritual responsibility. Ouch! The absence of prayer in a man's life helps to ensure one thing. That his promises of God's blessings to him is likely to remain underutilized, Mm -hmm. limited in strength, and in worst case, never uncovered at all. Men, we must learn to pray to stir up the gift that God has given us. He promises to bless, bless you more than you can comprehend. We know Moses started a prayer life and continued his relationship with God. God used him to do amazing things. I'm still learning how to go to God in prayer every day about everything. You you still struggle with that at at different times? You got control issues that you want to handle things on your own and you know that, you know, Lord, I should acknowledge you first. Now look what I did. <laughs> now, Lord, I'm coming to you to fix what I messed up. <laughs> if I listened to you the first time, I wouldn't have myself in this position. God wants a relationship with us like he had with Jesus. God wants a, a, a relationship with us like he had with Moses, like, like he had with Abraham, like, like he had with Noah. He wants a personal relationship with you. Don't you know God loves you? This is this, this, this some good stuff here. 
When my, it's good eating. When God got Moses' attention at the burning bush, he started restoring his spirit by uncovering Moses' deepest insecurities. Then he started packing Moses with godly courage. You know, Moses didn't want to go do his job. But God had to tell him, look, you could do this. And he took all those process, purged all of those shortcomings out of him and start packing him with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Courage. So Moses was able to go and do his job. He started restoring his spirit by uncovering Moses' deepest insecurities, then packing him with, 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 with godly courage and filling him with the Holy Spirit so that this, that same man who had common issues now was an uncommon inspiration to a whole nation. That same man who once was lost, y'all know it, now he's found. That same man who was once a gambler of his paycheck, with the Holy Spirit, he's able now to pay the check. That same man who once was unfaithful with the Holy Spirit packed down in his soul, he's now faithful. That same man who once was weak with the presence of the Holy Spirit, he's now strong. God knows how to prepare his people to complete his purpose. Let God use you starting in prayer. Aren't you glad that he saved you? Aren't you glad that the Lord saved you? Aren't you glad that God changed you? Aren't you glad that you're not the person that you used to be? Aren't you glad that God loves you? Am I here by myself? See, maybe y'all don't know from where I come from. I, I'd like you to talk back to me every now and then. Aren't you glad that God loves you? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I'm glad. And I'm here to give God all the glory. And I've decided that I'm, I will be a living sacrifice for him. Let us stand up and give God a hand clap of praise.